Hello, welcome to the pregnancy module. My name is Mason Shaner, and I'm a second year medical student at the University of Michigan Medical School. Together with Dr. Arian Kaplan, ophthalmologist, clinical assistant professor, and ophthalmology medical student clerkship director at Kellogg Eye Center, we present core learnings for understanding the ophthalmologic examination of the pregnant individual. This module covers three topics, the normal eye during pregnancy, eye disease specific to pregnancy, and pre-existing eye disease that worsens during pregnancy. During pregnancy, particularly in the second half, there is a decrease in intraocular pressure in healthy eyes. In patients with ocular hypertension, this decrease may be even larger. This change may stem from increased aqueous outflow, decreased episcleral venous pressure, decreased scleral rigidity, and generalized acidosis during pregnancy. Pressures usually return to pre-pregnancy levels by two months postpartum. The cornea retains water during pregnancy, causing a decrease in corneal sensitivity and an increase in corneal thickness and curvature. These changes produce temporary alterations and refraction, predominantly in late pregnancy, and are a relative contraindication to surgery seeking to repair corneal refractive error. The lens also thickens, contributing to refractive error and resulting in transient reduction in accommodation. Pregnant women are well advised to postpone obtaining prescriptions for new glasses or contacts. Pregnancy disrupts the production of tears by lacrimal acinar cells, resulting in drier eyes more susceptible to irritation. Lastly, Subconjunctival hemorrhage, also known as hyposphagma, occurs at increased frequency. A photo of this harmless condition is shown at right. When refractive power of the lens or the cornea focus on a point different than the eye length, a refractive error is said to occur. In hyperopia, the light focuses the image behind the retina, and in myopia, in the front. Corrective lenses for hyperopia are convex, and for myopia, concave. The shifting refractive power of astigmatism requires a cylindrical lens for image adjustment. Presbyopia, usually acquired later in life, rarely develops in pregnancy. On to eye diseases prompted by the pregnant state. The most dramatic and catastrophic disease of pregnancy is the life-threatening state of eclampsia and preeclampsia. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology defines preeclampsia as the onset of hypertension with either proteinuria or end-organ dysfunction. This usually occurs after the 20th week of gestation. The systolic blood pressure rises over 140 millimeters of mercury or the diastolic above 90. When seizures occur in this situation, the term eclampsia is applied. While women suffer postpartum preeclampsia most commonly during the first 48 hours, the illness may present up to six weeks after delivery. Patients may report blurred or decreased vision, photopsia or flashes of light, scotoma or a specific area of decreased vision surrounded by normal vision, diplopia or double vision, visual field defects, or blindness. Early in the disease, fundoscopy reveals arteriolar constriction. The normal ratio of artery to vein diameter is 2 to 3. On the right image, notice how the ratio is abnormal. The arteries appear much thinner. With disease progression, hypertensive retinopathic changes include diffuse retinal edema, hemorrhages, exudates, and or cotton wool spots. Hormonal changes, endothelial damage, hypoperfusion ischemia or edema, and coexisting systemic vascular disease may exacerbate this clinical picture. Fundoscopic changes are mirrored in the placenta, providing a screening tool for both maternal and fetal care. Preeclampsia or eclampsia can precipitate exudative retinal detachment. Accumulating fluid separates the neurosensory retina from the retinal pigment epithelium without a hole, tear, or break. 1% of preeclampsia patients and 10% of eclampsia patients experience exudative retinal detachment. If they have HELP syndrome, a condition both associated with and separate from preeclampsia characterized by hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets, they are seven times more likely to suffer exudative retinal detachment. The diagnosis is usually made bilaterally and postpartum. On the right is a fundoscopic image illustrating an exudative retinal detachment. Prognosis is usually good. Visual acuity resolves completely within weeks postpartum. 15% of preeclamptic and eclamptic women develop edema, ischemia, or ischemic infarctions of the occipital and parietal lobes of the brain or the thalamus, leading to syndromes of cortical blindness. The patient may believe they can see, but in fact cannot appreciate their visual surroundings and may develop altitudinal or homonymous visual field defects. Headache, hyperreflexia, or paresis are features commonly associated with cortical blindness. Pupillary light reflexes remain intact. An MRI is the imaging study with the greatest diagnostic yield. Findings include focal occipital lobe edema and or bilateral edema of the lateral geniculate nuclei in area of the thalamus. On the right is a T2 MRI showing hyperintense signal bilaterally in the occipital parietal regions at the mid-occipital level. Prognosis for cortical blindness is often good. When isolated, visual loss often recovers within 4 hours to 8 days. However, when bilateral inferior scotoma and visual field defects are reported, cortical blindness may persist for several months postpartum. Central serous chorioretinopathy, or CSC, 
is a disease unassociated with preeclampsia or eclampsia, but specific to pregnancy. Late in pregnancy, fluid accumulates subretinally within a circumscribed area in the macula at the level of the retinal pigment epithelium, forcing a neurosensory retinal detachment. The top image on the left shows the appearance of CSC. The bottom image is an optical coherence tomogram demonstrating subretinal fluid. Women experiencing CSC report moderately reduced visual acuity and unilateral metamorphopsia, a type of distorted vision in which a grid of straight lines appears wavy and parts of the grid may appear blank. Additional manifestations include central scotomas, delayed retinal recovery following photostress, loss of color saturation, and contrast sensitivity, the ability to discern an object from its background. On fendoscopy, white fibrous subretinal exudates are identified. On the right side are examples of how the ancillary grid appears to a patient so affected. On the top is an example of central scotoma, and on the bottom, metamorphopsia. In general, CSC resolves within a few months after delivery, and visual acuity returns normal. However, for some patients, visual changes persist. We turn to the effect of pregnancy on pre-existing ocular disease. Pregnancy worsens many pre-existing eye diseases, such as glaucoma, pituitary adenoma, and meningioma. We'll focus on the highly prevalent diabetic retinopathy. The hyperglycemia of diabetes damages the retina, leading to diabetic retinopathy. There are two types of diabetic retinopathy, non-proliferative, in which lipids and fluids seep into the retina causing damage, and proliferative, in which new blood vessels form causing traction on the retina. On the right are two examples comparing and contrasting proliferative and non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, respectively. Diabetic macular edema may also be observed with proteinuria or hypertension and may worsen during pregnancy. Isolated gestational diabetes is unassociated with a risk of diabetic retinopathy. Patients without diabetic retinopathy before pregnancy are unlikely to develop it during gestation. Patients diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy before pregnancy usually experience a worsening during the second trimester, followed by improvement during the third trimester and postpartum. Macular edema may result during postpartum. However, in some cases edema remains, leading to long-term visual loss. On the right is a fundoscopic image illustrating macular edema. Given the propensity for worsening of previously diagnosed diabetic retinopathy, consensus guidelines recommend that all pregnant diabetic patients have a baseline fundoscopic exam in the first trimester, even those without known retinopathy. For women diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy, they are encouraged to see an ophthalmologist at least once per trimester. Panretinal photocoagulation, a treatment for diabetic retinopathy, may be safely administered during pregnancy. Published studies report that undergoing laser treatment before pregnancy in patients with proliferative and severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy may reduce the risk of progression during pregnancy. Thank you for your attention. This slide completes the module.